Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast, where we discuss consciousness in all forms. December 2021, Episode 2, Anthony Peake's Roundtable with the Public, Part 2 of 7. He is a writer who deals with the borderline areas of human consciousness. So I was asking with people with the temporal um, epilepsy, uh, you know, oftentimes they're medicated with like a, like a carbamazepine or a tegretol type medication. I'm wondering how, in your opinion, does that suppress, if it does, uh, the other hemisphere or the less dominant or, the, or even the daemon in your experiences? This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. Terry, did you want to say anything? Uh, yes, it was just uh, when Anthony uh, mentioned uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, it just sort of triggered um, something that I was thinking about, and that is in terms of something that's called uh, terminal lucidity. Uh, and I'm mm. working through um, Anthony's books, his vast selection of books. Um, so I don't know if you've already spoken about this in any of your books or talks before, Anthony. Uh, but for those who don't know, terminal lucidity, and uh, I'm just reading this from uh, Wikipedia, uh, it's when somebody suddenly regains consciousness that occurs in the time shortly before death in patients suffering from severe psych- psychiatric or neurological disorders. And I know this happens in uh, people with dementia and Alzheimer's. So when you're talking about the brain as a receiver, uh, it makes sense for someone with dementia uh, to sort of lose the <laughs> sense of who they are, really, because the receiver is degrading. But with terminal lucidity, they often return to sort of pre-disease levels of uh, consciousness and so I just I just thought that was interesting I wonder if Anthony had anything to add on that oh most definitely most definitely you obviously haven't got to my latest book um the the hidden universe where I have a lot of sections on terminal lucidity and very much on a personal basis because of my own mother who died of Alzheimer's um around about three years ago Uh, Terminal lucidity is something that absolutely intrigues me. And I think, again, we can do the neurological model of this. As I say, I always start with the science. I don't start with experience. I start with the science. As you probably know, in terms of Alzheimer's, what happens is um, the neurons of the brain are attacked by things called amyloid plaques. And what the amyloid plaques do is they literally destroy and explode the structures inside the neurons known as microtubules. The microtubules are destroyed. And I'd argue that this is rather similar to inside the brain, somebody probably smashing the valves of an old valve radio. And what is happening there is because the the neurons are being compromised, it means that the brain's ability to act as an attenuator, which is the argument I was using before, starts to lose its ability to do so. And rather like when Oni was talking about his mother and schizophrenia, I'd argue that what happens is, individuals in in Alzheimer's and dementia, their doors of perception start to open. And in doing so, they go into a state of terminal lucidity. Now, there are two points here that I'd like to make. The first one is there is a phenomenon known as peaking Darian experiences. And peaking Darian experiences are something similar, whereby towards the end of life, somebody gets views of the wider universe. And it's called Peak and Darian Experience because of a poem written by Keats um, about the time when Balboa and Cortez first saw the Pacific Ocean from a height, from a peak in Darien. And Darien is a mountain that is in Panama, which overlooks the Pacific Ocean. It was the first time Europeans had seen the Pacific Ocean from that viewpoint. And Peak and Darian Experiences is when individuals start to see the wider world, their doors of perception are open. And again, and a friend of mine, um, a lady called um, Maggie Latorell, has written a book called The Gift of Alzheimer's, which discusses in detail these experiences because she witnessed it with her own mother. But I'd like to just tell you something about my own mother and what I witnessed, and this is extraordinary. My mother's own terminal lucidity took place. She had been in a state of semi-catatonia for, I don't know, four or five months. She hadn't spoken or anything. I visited her up in, 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 in Birkenhead and everything else in the home she was staying in, and she'd not communicated. I get a phone call from the home. I live down in West Sussex, so I can't immediately get to, I couldn't have got to my mother immediately, but I get a phone call from the, the home. And in the background, I could hear my mother shouting at the, the, uh, the nurses. And they said, can you please calm your, please, can you calm your mother down? She's in a state of hysteria. 
and we're, you're the only person we think that you could help. So I say, can you put her on? So my mother comes to the phone and she says, oh my God, Tony, thank you for this. She said, and she's talking to me and I'm thinking, this is amazing. And she said, these people, they have kidnapped me. I've been kidnapped by these people and I'm going to sue them. And when your father finds out, I'm going to sue all of them for this. And I said, calm down, mum. Why do you think you've been kidnapped? And she said, and this gets really freaky. She turned around to me and she said, I was watching Morecambe and Wise on television with your father. And I just did 40 winks. And I wake up and I'm here. And I said, my, my father's been dead for 10 years. And she said, no, 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 no. And then I discovered she was talking about 1973. And in 1973, she'd been watching Morecambe and Wise on TV. And suddenly she had moved to being somebody in their early 90s. And I said, Mum, look down at your hands. And she said, I don't need to look at my hands. And I said, please do, Mum. You're 92 years of age. And then she turned around and she said, who are you? And I said, I'm your son. And she said, no, you're not. You sound much older. My son's in his early 20s and he's at university. You're a much older man. You're part of it as well. I'm going to sue you. And she slammed the phone down. I then phoned back and they calmed her down. And then she went back into a catatonic state. But, and this is the fascinating thing, um, I have in my cheating the ferryman hypothesis, which we haven't talked about, I argue that we live our lives over and over again. And that in our lives, we, we repeat not our lives as a literal reliving of our previous life, but like you do in a computer game where you change things and your daemon is your game player that can change things. And I use the argument that there should be evidence that when we get old, we start to almost go back. Hang on one second, Anthony. I think you've lost your connection. Centered awareness. Melissa, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah, but I, I think can't hear Anthony. Anthony is talking, but we can't hear him at this present time. I don't know if you want to put yourself onto mute and then come off mute again to see if that causes a bit to change because you're still talking and I can't hear you. I shall now load up Skype and see if you can communicate to me. Melissa, take over for control for me. Okay. If there's anybody else that would like to, oh, Anthony's dropped down as a listener. Right. Um, if, if there's anybody else that would like to uh, ask Anthony any questions, raise your hand and I'll give you speaker access. We will give it about 10 seconds because, as you know, the delay tends to be that way. Yeah, you know, perception. Uh, what he, he was talking about is exactly like what I, I, I've seen. Excellent. Exactly like uh, there are times when he will tell us about uh, uh, our dad who, who already passed away, that uh, he's still alive. He's staying in another country somewhere in the world. So Okay. I'm just going to say to the people that have just come into the room, Anthony Peake has just had a connection issue. He's dropped out. He's sending me some information. So meanwhile, the people that have got speaker access, please tell me your thoughts about how you feel this conversation is going. Again, as you know, this is being recorded for test purposes. We might use it into a podcast, but to have your feedback of the questions that you've had answered. If you put your hand up, Melissa will ask you that. Will I read the information that's being sent back to me by Anthony, if you'd like to continue? Um, I'll, I'll start off as well. Um, I can definitely relate to what Anthony is talking about in regards to Alzheimer's and his mother, because I, I also lost my, uh, my father's mother to Alzheimer's. I think it was about two or three years ago. And it's exactly the same thing. Like um, she would semi-recognize myself, but wouldn't recognize my dad as her son um, and recognized her daughter as someone who would come and visit her every day, but didn't recognize her as a daughter. And she went back into time as well. And she was talking about when, cause she met my grandfather when they were very, very young in, in Greece. And she was speaking about, Oh, this young man came in and he was beautiful and he was wearing this, his Navy outfit and uh, or army. I think he was in the Greek army and she was talking about how handsome he was and she was describing him to a T. And, um, yeah, we, we were just standing there fascinated that she went back to, to those years when she was a, a young girl and she had met my grandfather. It was fascinating how that happens. But if anybody else wants to share, um, so John, okay, great, I'll let you come up. 
Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it was super fascinating and it was very kind of him to share with us a personal story. And it, it's interesting because I have three different examples in that I lost my grandfather to, um, ALS, uh, to ALS and um, he did have about 45 minutes of a very lucid moment right before he passed. And uh, luckily his children were there with him and were able to talk to him and they, they all were just blown away. But then later, um, actually myself as well, it was in um, uh, uh, October of 2017, I then lost my mother to uh, frontal temporal uh, dementia. And uh, then a month later, lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's. And in the case of my grandmother, she did not have a lucid moment because she never really lost lucidity. She had uh, time memory problems, but she was still fairly communicative. My mother, on the other hand, her brain was so destroyed that um, she had no lucid moments at all and basically just faded and faded and faded until she went away. And so seeing the three different examples, um, I thought it was a fascinating, fascinating contrast to what Anthony brought up. And um, I agree with him that I think so much of this is tied together in different states and, and different uh, paradigms. And, and um, you know, the, the one question I, I would love to get into at some point is the commonality between what he's talking about and um, some of the other phenomenons like like mediumship and so forth, where there seems to be some at least mechanical similarities to the way personalities change in a multi personality disorder person and a, um, a uh, what would I would consider a hardware medium, someone who actually takes on another personality versus a software medium that seems to just hear voices and how they mechanically compare to someone who's schizophrenic. Not that the same thing is happening, but they're mechanical similarities to how that behavior displays in the person. And so to me, all of this is just absolutely fascinating and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Hello, Thank John. you very Hi, much. John. I'm, I'm back, by the way, guys. I was just about to announce that you have returned and I was going to say in reply to John, thank you very much for obviously divulging the information. When Anthony's evaluated what's been going on here and if he thinks he would like to do more kind of Twitter space involvement with us and our group of people, we might even kind of push it further forward into the day for others to gather. So some people in America have a better timing or we might alternate depending on what goes on. It's what, no... we, what, we, what we could do is um, I'm happy to come back again um, uh, at around, I don't know, two o'clock, three o'clock this afternoon, um, UK time. I mean, I have no problem with that if everybody else is interested because I think we've, we're, we're dealing with some fascinating areas here and it's, it's, quite, it's going to be quite frustrating if we've got to cut it short, either through technological reasons or, or whatever. But I think we've got a very interesting discussion here and I feel that um, even restricting it to two hours sometimes is, is difficult because there's so many areas you can spin off on. And if you've ever been to one of my chats, which has been with Melissa, we tend to seem to break the four hour kind of mark between two and a half hours. I was just going to mention that as well. well we can I'm, never well, get well, it I'm down to an hour. Well, I'm more than happy to come back later. I mean, I, I will have to leave in, a, in about 30 minutes, 35 okay. minutes. Can, you've got the questions logged down. What time did you say that you would be free? Well, me. Yeah, sorry, um, Anthony, I, I forgot I, to I, your name. Yeah, sorry, I, I can be free from, uh, I don't know, half two onwards, really, um, without any real problem. I had a couple of things I needed to do today, but I can always uh, change them to tomorrow. Excellent. Now, I'm going to ask the floor if that's OK with them. I'm sure there's going to be quite a lot of people trying to change their schedule. There's also Tamara, who is Tamara Dick, and she works on a lot of films with visuals and graphics. I, it would be nice for you to actually have a quick conversation with her before we actually wrap this up and go, because we could just have, if there's anybody else in the group that was giving feedback of the information that you've been relaying, because you're away and you'll hear on the recording once we give it back to you, very good feedback from John. We we're just about to ask other people. So Tamara, would you like this opportunity to introduce yourself to Anthony Peake? I've just invited her to speak. I should have probably given her an invite. I thought I had. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think my invites are working for some reason because it happened with Bitcoin as well. Okay, I've now invited you tomorrow. You should see the actual request. Can you Excellent. hear me? Excellent. We can now. I'm going to put myself on mute so you have the opportunity to talk to Anthony Peake and introduce yourself. Mention where you kind of pick up the social media platform for him, whether it's books, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, so that we have a kind of record of where 
information is coming in from? Oh, well, I'm really new to the subject and to, um, to all of this. So I'm just like learning from the beginning. Welcome, welcome aboard. Um, I think is the uh, is the point, and uh, great to speak to you tomorrow. Just as a very quick Hi. point, Paul, how far did I get into my my uh, discussion on my mother's experiences and time slip? Did I complete it, or did I drop off beforehand? Well, you got to the point where you told her to look at her hands, and then she re you told her about 1973 in a manner she didn't recognize you then i think we got four words in i'm going to consult with melissa if she knows how far she heard and then we'll just see if anybody else got heard anything further because it was because very, very important out. yes okay melissa, this is very how far important, did you hear example. um i heard look down at your hands and um for her to recognize that she was in her 90s and that you said um you know, my father's been has passed away for at least ten years now, and then she asked, "Who are you?" Uh, and you said that you were her son, and that she said, "No, you're not. My son's nineteen. He's in university, uh, and I'm going to. You're in on this, and I'm going to sue you as well." And she hung up on you. Right. Perfect. And then, okay. And that you had you had called back, and then they said that they settled her down. Okay. Um, good. And and then I think after that you had just cut off. OK, OK, because this is quite important for the for you guys who are new to my work is that I have an overall concept I call cheating the ferryman. And I argue that we, as I said, we live our lives over and over again in like a commu computer simulation kind of um, scenario whereby we have our own gameplay, which is our guardian angel, our daemon or whatever. But I needed evidence for this, and I was quite intrigued in my mother's condition. And as you already realize, I start with science and take it from there. And um, I, I monitored my mother's deterioration, and she never really recovered again to communicate. But as she got older, I started to notice that she started to go into a fetal state. She started to move forward as if she was reversing back. Now, there is something called neonatalism, uh, which a guy called Barry... Rensberg uh, came up with, and he argued that if you trace through the decline of somebody into old age and Alzheimer's, and you reverse that and mirror reverse it, you get the development of the, the, the baby in the womb. You get exactly the same developments at exactly the same times. Now, this intrigued me. So I took the opportunity. There was a reflex I knew called the Babansky reflex. And this is whereby if you stroke the bottom of a child, a newly born baby's foot, the foot arches outwards or inwards, and I can never remember, to be honest, but it arches in one way or the other. And with adults, if you do it, it arches a different way. So you know that you have a very young child here, or, or even a fetus. I tested this on my mother, and the Babensky reflex that she had was of a baby and was of a fetus. Now, she was in a fetal position, she was going back to being a fetus. And this is absolute pure proof to me that as we get towards the end of our lives, if we are allowed to live our lives to old age, this is what we start to do. We go back in reverse. And I believe we're going back in reverse because there is a period of time where the baby's the, 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 the embryo in the womb and the dying person with Alzheimer's overlap. And that's why they're overlapping in the way they are. Now, if you die in an accident or of disease or everything else when you're younger, you don't have the same thing. You have an immediate return. But with this, I thought this was powerful evidence. But the other point I have is there is an old concept in, in Vedanta, the, um, the, the uh, Indian belief system, called the Linga Surya, or the long body. And they argue that we are all of our lives. If you took a time-lapse photograph of yourself from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death, you'd be like this long snake-like creature that winds around geographically. And it's very small, it gets bigger and bigger as you grow up, and then it starts getting smaller as you die. Now, you at any time in your life is one of the slices of the linga surya. So, and again, this comes back to science, and any scientist there will, will, will know about this. It's something called Minkowski time. Min Minkowski and time. Minkowski was um, uh, Einstein's teacher. And Minkowski time argues that there is... If you look at time from outside of time, from the fifth dimension, time is different. 
And again, many of you will probably see parallels here with the movie um, uh, Interstellar, where there's the famous Tesseract sequence, where Coop, the central character, is looking back at the life of his daughter. This is pure cheating the frame. This is purely a lot of the, the ideas I put forward in terms of this. The idea is we are all ourselves. And I argue that what happened was my mother, during her terminal lucidity, was communicating with an earlier version of herself, which is still coexistent with herself when she was in her 90s. And again, finally, I'll finish this off with a line from the J.B. Priestley play, Time and the Conways, the end of Act Two. And I've written a book on J.B. Priestley and J.B. Priestley's plays. J.B. Priestley, some of you may know, it was a very famous in the 1940s, 50s, very, very famous British playwright and novelist. And in this play, um, there's a time slip takes place. Uh, and the central, one of the central characters um, is, is describing to his sister about life. And he said, we are all of our lives. You know, from the moment of our birth to a moment of our death, we are all of our lives. And maybe life is just a dream. And all we'll do is when we'll die, we'll go back and live the dream again. And this is, again, cheating the ferryman and my overall hypothesis. Right, okay, that's finished that little bit. Um, uh, any questions? I'd like to go back if I can. I, I feel that we, we've overlooked uh, Greybeard, Toby's question, what he wanted to ask earlier on. Um, could you, you ask it again? And do you think you have enough time to complete that? And can Greybeard come back again, or would he like it done now? Um, either way, Paul, I can come back later, or we can answer it now. I mean, it's up to it's, Anthony, I it's guess. Up to, <laughs> it depends how big an explanation you're going to have, Anthony, at this point. By the way, Renegade has sent me a message. He's just popped back. He's at work. He hasn't got the opportunity to actually talk to you, but he says thank no. you very much for the... <laughs> oh, you can talk now. Uh, thank you. Uh, for a few minutes, I can talk because I'm leaving for work now. I was uh, about to give you a message, but no, before, you just be shoot me back. Before I wanted to... Uh, uh, disappear in uh, thin air i want to say thank you to all and uh, anthony thanks for all the amazing stuff you are telling and uh, i hope to see you next time and uh, sorry for my short time uh, anyway uh, good luck and have a nice day to all of you renegade i don't know if you heard but at 2 30 this time in the uk we're having another session anthony is free i'm going to consult quickly with melissa melissa will you be free for 2 30 uk time I just, I just sent you a message. Um, I, hang on, I've got two eyes on two different devices at the moment. <laughs> it's 9.30 p.m. here now. Um, what time is it in the UK? Let me just double check. It's 11.36 at the present time. Okay, so it's only a few hours away. Yeah, I should, I'll, I'll be free. That's fine. Can I just quickly come in here if Renegade is still here? Just to let Renegade know that... Sure, sure. Um, okay. Okay. Um, the two of my books are in Dutch. Three, no, four of my books are in Dutch, uh, if you're interested. My first two books are in Dutch. No, I, and I, my Philip K. Dick book is in Dutch. But my Dame and the Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self is in Dutch, as is the first book. Um, and if they're, they're published by, um, oh, it's a, a, a Dutch publisher. I can't remember the name now. But if you check them out, it's Der Daemon. Uh, I will find um, it on, uh, on the internet. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, lovely to, yeah, love to talk to you. Uh, you too, Anthony, and uh, yeah, have fun today. Uh, Will do. Right, are we are we okay to go back? Because I'm just concerned about. Yes, I would uh, go back Greybeard. to Greybeard now. Yes, That's, we've got okay. most things sorted. Oh, I'm sorry, you wanted to hear the question again. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so I was asking with people with the temporal um, epilepsy. Uh, you know, oftentimes they're medicated with like a like a carbamazepine or a tegretol type medication. I'm wondering how, in your opinion, does that suppress, if it does, uh, the other hemisphere or the less dominant or the or even the daemon in your experiences? Uh, it's quite a, a fascinating question, this, because, again, in the work I have done with um, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and urologists, and individuals who experience temporal lobe epilepsy, it is quite intriguing because the general argument they give to me is that the when they take these, they feel that the kind of edges have been taken off their perceptions, as if they've been dulled down in some way. And many of them prefer to go through the state rather than 
have the, the, the chemicals to stop them experiencing these things. Um, and I'll give an example of this. One of my, um, uh, in my first book, I have a section on um, a guy called uh, two brothers, Emile and Jules Goncourt, who were French realist novelists in the mid 19th century. And Goncourt turned around and he said, I consider my life to be a nothing between two epileptic seizures. But more importantly, what Fyodor Dostoevsky said, Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, also suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy. And he, in his book, The Idiot, the idiot, the character, the idiot, Prince Myshkin, um, is based upon Dostoevsky. And he says, and he said, I would give up all my life for that sensation I have before I go into a temporal lobe seizure. Now, I'm not saying in any way that TLE is anything other than an awful thing to have, as are all forms of epilepsy. But epileptics tell me, or people who experience epilepsy tell me that, you know, they go into the most wonderful places and the most wonderful states. And of course, the classic example of this is my good friend, Myron Dial. And Myron Dial um, manifested during a, a TLE seizure state, his daemon, Charon. And Charon manifested itself when I think Myron was four years of age and he's been with him for the rest of his life. And indeed, this is really weird. When, I, when Myron first contacted me after he read my book, Is the Life After Death? And he said, you're the first writer that's actually hit the nail on the head with this. And he said, the, the email said, and he said, in fact, this email is from Caron. It's not from Myron. So my first communication was with <laughs> a, a dame. Uh, and he said, you're absolutely right. And everything you say is absolutely right about our role in people's lives and everything else as well, which I found absolutely extraordinary and uncanny. And if you're interested in any of Myron's work, um, breaking news, it, this morning Myron posted something on Facebook and I've agreed to have Myron come back for a fourth time and we're going to do a two-hour session discussion with him um, about his experiences. Um, That's and excellent. Again, Sorry for butting in, but um, when we see hands up, it's best to see whether if you're going past the point or not. I think you would agree with it's okay for trying to not have to roll back a conversation, Anthony. Yep. Okay. So, so Gabe, uh, do you have something which is just at this point which you would like to present to Anthony? Yes. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, my question is, um, do you think uh, temporal lobe epilepsy can begin in the dream state? Um, because I've been having a lot of uh, vivid dreams. And a, I, I believe a daemon has manifested itself in my dreams and i and i nicknamed them tricky because he uh imposes a lot of tricks to me and a lot of uh, questions and riddles and puzzles and I, and I, I write about it in my um in my dream diary i just wanted to start that point excellent point this is really good discussion this um in my book the hidden universe i discuss the role of or the potential identification of the entities that people experience in dream sequences, people experience in, in DMT experiences, and, and altered states of consciousness as to what their role is. Now, I would argue, and in one of my books, I do the neurochemistry of this, and I think what may be taking place in certain dream states is that the pineal gland is synthesizing melatonin which is the sleep drug. You know, when you go to sleep, melatonin is excreted by the pineal gland, which, and of course, it's interesting, again, just a bit of uh, neuro, neurophysiology, if you're interested, is that the pineal gland is light sensitive and it sits directly above what's called the optic chiasma, which is the, um, the, 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 the channels by which light or, or the light signals are sent from the retina to the visual cortex, and it sits directly above it. And this means it's sensitive to whether the channels are active or not and when the channels cease to be active it realizes that it's dark outside and it starts to release melatonin which is what makes you go to sleep but interestingly enough the the chemical constituents of melatonin are very very similar to dmt and there is an argument to say that you could the the pineal gland could synthesize um melatonin into dimethyltryptamine and of course dimethyltryptamine is one of the most power as 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 rn knows is one of the most well the most powerful hallucinogenic substance known to man with the possible exception of 5-meo dmt and 
Rick Strassman, who was a psychiatrist at the University of New Mexico in the early 1990s, did a project with the American government, and he worked with a lot of individuals who had volunteered to take DMT, and they all had, en all had encounters with entities, or many of them. And uh, Strassman came to the conclusion that he considered DMT to be our reality modulator. So in other words, both the visual world that we exist in now this collective hallucination that we call consensual reality is just as much a dream sequence as any dream sequence that you have. And when you're in dream sequences, I argue the doors of perception are open and you encounter entities. Now, is it the daemon? Now, I'd argue that, yes, the daemon uses dreams to communicate. And I would argue that the daemon uses dreams to either show its precognitive abilities, which explains precognitive dreaming, and again, if anybody's interested, one of my associates in this is Dr. Arthur Funkhauser, who is um, the world's leading authority on the phenomenon known as deja vu. And he has something called the dream theory of deja vu, whereby he argues that a deja vu sensation is a precognitive dream you've had recently that you've forgotten about and you suddenly start to remember it. And because when in dreams, you know, we don't fully remember our dreams, but we subliminally remember them. So you've had the dream and in the dream you've you've had this experience then in reality you start experiencing the experience and you have this vague memory because the definition of deja vu is quite precise and it says it's the remembering of something from an undefined part of your past that's the definition put forward by uh, vernon nepe who's a professor of psychiatry um, in in washington state and he's literally the world's expert on deja vu and that's the definition. So it's 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 not a remembering of something that you recognize. It's the opposite. It's 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 a recognition of something, but you don't know when it was. So when people can say, oh, it's deja vu all and everything, that's wrong. It's not what Hang on one second, Anthony. There's technical difficulties turning up. You suddenly slightly dropped out. So we'll just uh, address that. If you would like to talk to me to see if the volume comes Check. back to the standard. That's Checking going one, two, well. Three. That's fine. What you will also find is because Oni's also put his hand up, it might also be relevant to you because of his background with his mother as well. So yeah, yeah, I fine. don't know if we want to quickly check with him and then we go with that. And still we're on topic with Greybeard's one because it's all connected with these people. Of course. Lucky of enough, course. my lucky enough, this community that we have has lots of experience and they feel safe enough to share quite a lot of private information, which, again, they're quite happy for us to record. And again, I have to say thank you very much for coming back for 2.30 and continuing this conversation. Okay, because what we could do is, is get something out on Facebook as well to say that, that, you know, it's been an incredible session and we're going to continue it um, because, you know, we, you know, I'm sure that a lot of other people will be interested in checking this out. I think you'll probably find from the raised hands in the room in a minute that, that everyone is actually saying the same thing. If you would like to come off uh, mute and just say whether you are quite happy to come back for 2.30, then we'll have Oni's question. We'll go back on mute again and then continue with Greybeard's answer. I might come back for 2.30. Yeah, I've already said that I'll be back. Yeah, I'll come at 2.30 uh, as well. Definitely for me as well. I'm glad to hear such a response. I've had people coming back to me and saying that this is amazing discussion. They've had to go off to work and come back again. I'm now going to obviously be on the promotion circuit once we finish this conversation and see what happens next. But again, thank you very much for giving all these kind of personal details from yourselves. Oni, was there something that you wanted to slide into the conversation that would help Anthony with the answer on Greybeard's one? Yes, uh, my question is uh, is in regard with uh, uh, people who are who are born abnormal, like abnormal. Let's say, for instance, not normal, like uh, maybe you are born uh, via a bridge, and then how does a daemon play a role there? Like uh, you know, and uh, again with uh, people who are born abnormal, like uh, what does uh, the sliding of reality because of some they become somehow like uh, what happened i'm a very inquisitive person uh just bear with me with my questions so uh like what really happened with the reality that they are in and with this reality like uh, 
the I was yeah, just going to cool. say with your for this one, I think you would actually be talking about the number of cells that normally die through standard birth, won't you? I think, and that will tie in with the temporal lobe epilepsy. Yeah, I think I think it's a, a very important question, and it may be I may be answering slightly wrong the question in slightly a different way, but it's still an important one to, to make the point. And I think it, it's um, thank you only for this. Um, in cheating the ferryman, I argue that we we live our lives again. And we live our lives again and again. And in fact, the Russian edition of my book was called Groundhog Life. Now, the major question that people have concerns with, and it's a very, very valid one, is what if somebody's born um, that, you know, that they have terrible physiological problems, they're born in pain, they have all these difficulties. And my answer to this is that and I give the title of a recent book written by Brian, Professor Brian Cox and Professor Brian Forshaw on quantum physics. And the subtitle of it was Everything That Can Happen Will Happen in what's called the multiverse. OK, the, 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 there's growing evidence that this is one of billions and billions of universes. And each one, some of them are subtly different, some of them are markedly different and some of them are totally different. But in each one of the universes, there will be a version of you whose information field has already been created. And that goes for every single human being. But not only the outcome of the decisions you make in your life are in the multiverse and in the information field, but the decisions that your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents going back for hundreds of generations are all in there. Now, if somebody is born with an illness or a congenital illness or they die very young or whatever, there will be a universe where they were born perfect. There will be a universe where the, the, the DNA worked differently for them. Um, and I genuinely believe that when somebody dies under those circumstances or lives a life under those circumstances, there will be another life that the daemon can choose that they won't be and it's remember we are witnessing we are all witnessing everybody else in this world through our reliving of our life but this is just your version of the universe populated by people who coincidentally are here with you in this consensual reality but there'll be versions of people that you will you will not know about who might live perfectly good lives and this is what I prefer to believe rather than the idea that a child is born, lives in agony for six weeks and then dies and then disappears. You know, the idea, the, the atheistic viewpoint or the materialist viewpoint is that you're just born and you die. And that's it. So in the, the overall shape of things, the universe existed for billions of years. Then something came into existence for an infinitesimal small time and then died again. I think that is a tragedy beyond understanding. I don't even begin to comprehend why that should be. Whereas if, and this is a profoundly important one, remember I made my point earlier on about my Oberdaemon, that human humanity itself is one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. We are all one consciousness and we're individuated parts of that consciousness that are within what I call the pleroma within this, no, the kenoma, this, this illusion of separation. And we know this from quantum physics. We know in quantum physics, there's something called um, superposition. It's a known phenomenon. Whereas you take two subatomic two, 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 two sub particles, put them in the same um, resonation, put them in the same quantum state, and then you put them apart. However far apart they are, they are in direct communication with each other as if they are one single object. Now, if the universe came from the Big Bang, this means that the whole of the universe was a singularity, which means every subatomic particle in the universe is entangled with every other subatomic particle in the universe, as is every consciousness. So in which case, after the Big Bang, we have this illusion of separation because we have this illusion of space. Ernest Mack, the great uh, German philosopher come physicist argued this, that if there were not objects in space, would space exist, if it makes sense? You know, and, and it's a very important point. Space is an illusion. Time is an illusion. It's only we exist within this time, temporal time space. And again, I wrote a book a few years ago called um, The Labyrinth of Time, 
which I describe all this as to how this can be. So for me, it's very liberating. The other alternative, which doesn't make sense to me, but I know it does for a lot of people, is reincarnation. And the idea this person dies in this life and is reborn again, whole in another life. Well, reincarnation would argue that the reason that person has been born the way they are is a, is a punishment for something they did in a previous life. Isn't that awful? So a child is born because somebody else in another life did something terrible and they have to suffer for it. That, that to me is wrong. To me, it doesn't make sense. But there are also other problems I have with reincarnation just in terms of logic, like how can reincarnation be progressive if you don't remember your previous lives? If you don't remember what you did in your previous lives, how can you ever get it right? Whereas cheating the ferryman argues, yes, you do live your life as you with your daemon remembering what you did last time, which allows you to put right all the things you put wrong last time. Don't we? Wouldn't we all like that opportunity to maybe ask that girl out that we didn't? not marry that person, maybe take that job opportunity in Australia that we had the chance of. That's what cheating the ferryman says, because the day and next time round, when the job opportunity comes up to go to Australia, little voice in your head or you have a precognitive dream or whatever. And the daemon will say, hey, guy, hey, hey Adelon, take that job this time, because I want to know what happened. Because, of course, when you do that, it's new for the daemon as well. So it's a new adventure, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. We've just had some new people turn up, and I just want to do a quick public service announcement. We are returning to this session UK time at 2.30 today. If you know of people and they would be interested in this subject, whatever social media platform they're on, go tell them, and we will send out links as well, because it is going to be such a fantastic discussion taking it further down the line. And I think my co-host, Melissa, will also agree on this Maybe I'm Sorry. wrong. Maybe she's never going to no. talk to me again. <laughs> Sorry, there was a delay. Um, yes, I'll be coming back, and uh, I'll, uh, I definitely agree. I, I was look. I was for a while. I've been saying to Paul, "You've got to get Anthony Peake into this space." And when he told me that he's got Anthony Peake in this space, I was super, super excited. So I'm a little bit shy tonight. So if you can, <laughs> there's a superstar in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> As Arnold Schwarzenegger just walked in, is that's why everybody was saying I'll be back? Because <laughs> everyone, every, like the people that normally come in here, would know that I'm actually quite talkative normally in the other room. So. <laughs> oh gosh, I make people go mute. That is terrifying, isn't it? But, uh, right, I'm aware of time now. We've got about three or four minutes. Is there any one final point anybody would like to make? Because I will have to shoot off and make preparations for this afternoon now. There's one here from John, and also before he actually has this, I would just, uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for the time and also for the time that you'll be giving this afternoon. Roughly how much time will you have so that we can tell people? I could have two or three hours. Again, I will consult with my co-host to see if she's there. I will obviously be able to do that time, but obviously your time is, obviously. Yeah, if it's, yeah, no, that, that's fine. It's 10 p.m. here now, so um, that should be fine. If it gets too late, like, I, I, I let you guys we'll know. Just, we'll just hear you snoring in the background quietly. <laughs> I'll hold we'll the <laughs> fort. I'll hold the fort. Okay, so John, if you want to ask your question. Yeah, and, and, and once again, I, I do apologize. I will not be able to make it to the second session. It's 4 a.m. here, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this. But all I wanted to say, uh, Anthony, is, is I don't know if you're aware of the work of Dr. Gary Nolan at Stanford. Um, he's been working with Jacques Vallée, and one of the things they've been looking at is people that claim to have had uh, some kind of experience with, with, an, with a, a, an off-world entity. And one of the things they've focused on is actually differences in the corpus callosum between people who have experienced this and people who have not. And so there appears to be some similar connection between the corpus callosum in those people and the way the corpus callosum might work in the communication between the hemispheres and possibly even between the daemon. And so I just wanted to bring that up because I don't know if you're aware of his research. No, no, I wasn't. And that's a very exciting development because one of the things I argue in my latest book, um, uh, The Hidden Universe, is about children who experience um, seeing 
creatures and, and everything else as well. And I argue that effectively we're misdiagnosing this. And in fact, it's Charles Bonnet syndrome that the children are experiencing. But I then wanted to understand why is it that children and elderly people see entities in the way they do? And I focused in on the corpus callosum for, for two or three different reasons. The first one I thought was fascinating was that the corpus callosum is not um, fully created until somebody's about 10 or 11 years of age. So up until that point, the corpus callosum in terms of the communication is different. So there is an interesting parallel with the work of Nolan and Valet. But also the, the myelination of the neurons is different as if the, because as you know, the myelination of neurons uh, are the kind of the insulation that doesn't allow the ele electromagnetic energy within the neurons to dissipate out into the brain. But the myelination doesn't take place until you're quite older. So again, is this is this how the Charles Bonnet syndrome is being? By the way, Charles Bonnet syndrome is a known medical effect. My mother experienced it, which we can talk about later. But I'm very interested in that. I'm a huge fan of Jacques Vallée. Uh, and indeed, in my new book, I'll be talking a lot about this work. And very finally, just really, really intriguing, is um, the work I've done with people who are savants have savant syndrome and one of the most famous people who have savant syndrome was a guy called Kim Peek that you probably know who was the guy that was the Rain Man was based upon the movie and Kim Peek didn't have a corpus callosum and people have argued that the reason why Kim Peek could do what he could do was directly related to his lack of a corpus callosum so we have some intriguing areas here to to develop upon later now what i'd suggest guys if you have the opportunity maybe just have a look at my website have a look at my have a look at the stuff on facebook that i'm doing you might pick up with a lot of stuff there and also please 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 if you've got a bit of time check out my uh youtube channel there's lots of interviews there with people that are doing this research at the moment that you might find very interesting which will give us more to talk about later when we get together at um in two and a half hours time so all I can say is thank you very much. And Paul, thank you so much for being involved on the, in this. Uh, no problem. I really, really appreciate it. Melissa and myself are just so grateful for you to come here and actually spend the time. And the community that's building up is so good for the interlockingness of it all. And we're just sharing so much and finding out just unbelievable things. And if you want to all come okay, back. Paul, can you, can, can, you, can you do me a favor then, Paul? Could you, could you post on my Facebook wall the link you create for the, the next show so Definitely. that people on Facebook have got it? Yeah. Because I know that there's an awful lot of people who are my American friends and even some of the UK friends who would have been involved in this had it been slightly later. Um, That's not a problem. So um, if we could, we could, we could get some interesting regulars in my world and indeed in your world involved as well. It'd be great yes. if Myron could join us, for instance. That would be good. He says he doesn't have a Twitter account. You'd probably have to see about helping him create one and explain to him that phone and tablet and headphones should be all charged, etc. That's the main thing okay. about this environment. Well, we can, we can do it again and we can probably get Oh, Myron definitely. Well, Hang on one second. Okay. Here's, yeah, okay. Thank you very much for all your time. I'm gonna, just going to keep the room open for myself. So I'm going to talk to the rest of the people, close yep. it down. Chat, make chat, sure they all chat understand. without me. Chat without me, and I'll speak to you no all problem. soon. Okay, okay, thanks, guys. Speak See to you later. Bye, bye. To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts, and share. Come and join our live events. That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along.